Welcome. Welcome to this fourth Sunday in our autumn series, Beguiled by Beauty, creating a life of contemplation and compassion. We are the Congregational Church of Birmingham United Church of Christ, and I'm Louise Ott, your pastor and friend. Today, we focus on the beauty of God's name, God's self. God is our focus when we look within and when we look out at the world. As we enter sacred space, let us consider the beauty of God, which is infinite. The spiritual part of ourselves is a divine abyss. Our bodies were made for perceiving the beauty of the world, a flower, a kiss, a stunning and vibrant green hillside, a newborn baby. And yet all the art in the world cannot capture exactly what it feels like to experience the divine nature of these things. The path of unknowing is to both savor what the senses it can take in, but also wonder at the mystery of unfathomable depths of even a single atom. Thank you. 
Divine goodness pauses us for this moment, bears us up in this time, and holds us for eternity. We offer ourselves in connection with God. We allow ourselves this love from God. We release ourselves into God's presence, and we sing together, God of the sparrow, God of the whale. God of the sparrow, God of the whale, God of the swirling stars, how does the creature say, Lectio Divina passage, the psalmist describes the attributes of God for which praise is given, justice and compassion. This is unlike any dead idol that claims to be a God. This is a Holy Spirit that moves and breathes, setting the beauty of creation in motion and creating even now. Let's drink in this living God and offer our praise as our scripture is read by Amy Young. Psalm 135, verse 1 to 3, and verses 13 through 21. Alleluia! Praise the name of Yahweh. Sing praise, you who serve the Most High, who stand in the house of Yahweh, in the courts of God's house, Alleluia! God is good. Sing praises to God's name because it is beautiful. Yahweh, your name stands forever. Your fame is told from one generation to the next. For you do justice for your people, and you have compassion for your faithful. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they can't speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. There is never a breath on their lips. Their makers will come to be like them, and so will all who trust in them. House of Israel, bless Yahweh. Priests of the temple, bless Yahweh. Attendants of the sanctuary, bless Yahweh. You who revere Yahweh, bless Yahweh. Blessings from Zion upon Yahweh, who dwells in Jerusalem. Alleluia. And now we have a special time for children. 
I'm Carmel Tinnis, the Director of Christian Education. Today, we continue on our search for beauty. I don't think we have to look around too far to see beauty, do we? And yet, if we can look far, far away, we see even more beauty. Have you ever gone outside on a clear night and looked up? What do you see when you do that? Close your eyes with me for a minute. Let's pretend that we are now outside and it is night and we look up. Go ahead with your imagination. Do you see something? Now look around in your home or here where we are filming worship and see if you can see a star. And there's stars all around. If you attended Zoom Sunday School this morning, we made stars. For some of you, that may be the star you see. Stars are some of the most amazing things we get to see. And because of a telescope called Hubble that has been taking pictures close up way out in space, we now know just how incredibly beautiful stars and planets and galaxies really are. They are so far away that our eyes can't take in the full beauty. It's so amazing. Sometimes when we see the beauty around us, we can't come up with words to describe it. We might just go, wow. That's all we can say. Thank goodness we have that word, wow, to express how we feel. Now, you can say wow to show God how amazed you are by what you see. It can become a word of prayer. In our echo prayer, we have said some other simple words that can be prayer on their own. Thanks and help. Wow, thanks, and help. Three simple words that can be our prayers. Now, this week I invite you to find a way to make some stars for your bedroom. Get an adult to help you think about ways to do this. And as a prayer at bedtime, look up at the stars and pray with these three simple words. Wow, thanks, and help. God knows us and loves us. And God knows that sometimes it's hard to find the words we need when we pray. But wow, help, and thanks will be enough. Now, we've learned quite a few new signs with our echo prayer. Last week, we learned the sign for beauty. Will you do that one with me? Beauty. Let's try that again. Beauty. Today, we'll learn the sign for earth. And I hope that you will find many times of wow prayers this week as you live on our beauty-filled planet. So the sign for Earth is taking your middle finger and your thumb and putting them together and then putting them on the wrist of your other hand and moving them around, just like our planet goes around. So let's do that again. Earth. And now today, a lot of our signs are starting to move together. And today, we put together the sign for beauty and the sign for Earth. So let's do those two together once, just to practice. Beautiful Earth. One more time. Beautiful Earth. Very good. Well, let's say the prayer together. I'll say the phrase with the sign and then make the sign with you as you repeat the phrase with the sign. God of goodness. Thank you for beauty. Thank you for life. Help me help you. 
to be a messenger of good news for the beauty of the earth. Amen. to sleep Before I start counting sheep I greet the night with awe For just as the light was vanishing from my sight I could not believe what I saw Three shooting stars converging into one Streaking their way across the horizon As I began to this odd occurrence in the skies A quiet voice said softly Just for now, just enjoy the mystery So I say, oh rushes in with storm clouds and biting wind and off in the distance I hear thunder lightning striking on the hill across the highway amazed by what I see wise for me to stay giving up I turn to go but even as the dark winds blow a gentle rain calls to me just for now just enjoy the mystery so I say As the sun's rays 
were reaching the morning haze. I could not believe what I saw. The faintest outline of your guiding hand Holding me with much more love than I could ever understand I simply am not worthy of this overwhelming gift of love But then a voice said softly, just for now just enjoy the mystery just for now just enjoy the mystery so i say Our guest preacher and teacher today is Rabbi Aaron Bergman of Congregation Adat Shalom. Rabbi Bergman and I have worked together on community organizing over the years. And Elaine and Dad and I were at his family table for the first night of Passover in 2018. During our sabbatical journey last fall, Rabbi brought the message in person. This year, during the pandemic of our time, our time with Rabbi is virtual. Nonetheless, we will be blessed by his message. People don't have idle hands. Hi, I am so happy and honored to be able to share some thoughts and a message with you again. I loved being uh, with you last year. I loved your openness of mind, of spirit, your sense of generosity. I loved the give and take that we were able to have. And it makes me very sad that we can't do that, but I'm so glad that I can share these ideas. I'm also really glad you invited me back. Uh, doesn't always happen. You know, the first time, that's on me. Second time, that's on you. And the fact that you invited me back, I am really, really, uh, really grateful. And I am grateful to my sister in the ministry, Louise Ott, uh, not just for this, but for everything that she does. Uh, so the uh, text uh, that I'm going to be talking about is Psalm 135. Uh, now, normally, uh, when I give a talk, I try to be really linear. I try to be uh, really connected. Um, I'm going to be honest, that isn't this. I haven't thought linearly uh, since uh, the COVID situation began, but I do have a lot of thoughts and maybe they will come together and uh, be somewhat useful. But I just want to let you know, I am going through all the feels that you're going through with in all the struggles. And uh, the beauty of these texts is that it helps us uh, make sense of our world, at least uh, how we can approach it, how we can think about things without becoming too inward, without being too crushed down by everything that's going on, and by maintaining our humanity. And that's really what this psalm is about, especially the sections that, uh, that I will be talking about. Now, people might say, well, what's the big deal about idolatry? which is what this psalm is about. It seems kind of benign with everything else that's going on in the world. It seems like a very old-fashioned, out-of-date thing to, uh, to worry about, but I think there's actually a tremendous amount of relevance for uh, what we are going through today. Uh, my late beloved professor, Fritz Rothschild, uh, who was a refugee from Germany himself, had a wonderful definition of idolatry. He said, idolatry is making something that is not very important or just has some importance 
and making it of supreme importance, making it matter more than anything else. And that's really what the danger is, is when our priorities get out of whack. Something might be important, but when we make it supremely important, when we obsess over it, that's where it really becomes very problematic. Uh, so I'd like to look at some of the ideas in the, uh, the psalm itself. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, one of the lines says, Atzebeham kesev zahav ma'aseh b'nei adam, that the hands of the idols are made by human hands. There's kind of an irony in this, is that the idol cannot create itself. You know, it's something that's supposed to be so important, yet it needs us. So I'd like to work through some of the, uh, some of the issues here about the difference between idols and uh, human beings and why it's so important to hang on to our uh, human identity and not make things, not make other issues more important than human dignity, more important than seeing human beings as being created in God's image and ultimately our connection to uh, to God as well. If you look at the uh, the story of the creation of the world in the book of Genesis, God creates the world, God creates humanity and says that it is good. Now, the word in Hebrew is tov, uh, that means good, but tov doesn't mean finished. Tov means that there is capacity for change, there is capacity for growth. Things are ever evolving. Nothing stays the same. God creates a world, God creates a universe where the only constant is change. And how well we adapt to that, how much we embrace that will be the difference between our suffering and our salvation. So let me move ahead a little bit to the uh, the story of Abraham, who is considered to be the uh, the first of the first monotheist and the uh, father of the uh, the Western monotheistic tradition in uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. You know the, the question that our sages ask is really why Abraham. If you look at the story of Abraham in the Bible, he is one of the least likely people that you would ever pick to begin a new nation, that he was uh, older, uh, he was jobless, he was homeless, uh, he didn't have any children. Uh, if, uh, if a husband and wife by the age of 100 and the age of 90, they don't have a child, it's probably unlikely at that point. I mean, I never say give up to anybody, but it, it's, it's unlikely. Um, but they do have children, and it is amazing. And the question is, why, why does God pick Abraham? And there's a story in Jewish tradition where Abraham not only comes from a family of idolaters, but actually comes from a family of idol manufacturers, uh, that his father Terah was an idol maker and a, a retailer of, uh, of fine idols. And uh, one day Abraham looks at the idols and he says, you know, they don't really do anything. And um, he pushed them over and he broke all the idols. And his father comes back to the store and he says to Abraham, what happened to the idols? And Abraham says, well, they got in a big fight and they beat each other up and that's why they're all broken. And Abraham's father, Terak says, but you know, they're just statues. And Abraham says, well, if they're just statues, why are we bothering? Why don't we celebrate humanity? And this is what we see with Abraham and Sarah's tent a little later on. Abraham and Sarah have the ability to see the humanity in anyone. And they are sitting out in the tent and these three strangers come by and they are clearly on the run. Uh, they are lost. They are hungry. They have nothing. Most people would have considered them to be either a danger or a complete and total waste of time. But that's not Abraham and Sarah. Instead, they open not just their hearts, but they make a feast not just for substance, not just enough food for these three beings who turn out to be angels in disguise to get to the, uh, to the next place, but really making an, an incredible feast. And this is the greatness of Abraham and Sarah is that they have a big tent, it is open to everyone, and they are not judgmental to anyone. They didn't ask these three men, and they only appeared as men to them. Why are you in the predicament you're in? Why didn't you solve things yourself? They know that the only judge is God and that it's their obligation to be helpful. 
And this is why I think you see uh, such a strong ban on idolatry. And I'm going to share a, a couple ideas. One is from uh, a relationship to the story of creation. Idols are static and unchanging. They don't grow. They don't do different things. You can't train an idol to do things. An idol is a representation that the world should be exactly the way it is. And if you're a winner, you stay a winner. And if you're a loser, you stay a loser. And the winners are winners because of what they did. And the losers are losers because of what they did. And not just because of an accident of birth or circumstance making one person more fortunate than the other. Idolatry says the world is the way it is and it should not be changed or messed with. And this is very limiting. It keeps people in a very narrow place. And the idea of liberation, the idea of the story of the Exodus was to be taken away from the narrowness of our lives and to see our capacity for change, to see our capacity for growth, even when it's super scary. Like change is very difficult, but things are always changing. In our tradition, you know, when there's a difficult time, we say to someone, Gamzo Yavor, this too shall pass. But it always passes. Uh, now, it would be harder to say someone in a happy situation, you know, don't worry, this is going to pass soon also, but it's going to. Things are always changing. Things are always evolving. And God gave us the ability to grow and to change as long as we don't fight against these things. That's why they, uh, we have a story in our tradition that a, uh, a human beings, when they make coins, each coin is exactly the same, but when God makes human beings, every single human being is completely different, completely unique and valuable. It's a really a celebration of diversity. You know, the psalm talks about gold and silver with the idols, but not everyone has gold and silver, but we all have gifts. We all have abilities. We all have something to offer. And this goes to another issue of the, uh, the ban on idolatry, uh, especially uh, during the, uh, the, the Roman occupation of uh, the land of Israel, which really begins the first century BCE, continues into the uh, fourth century of the, uh, the Common Era. Our rabbis were very, very strong against the idea of idolatry, because if you look at the Greek and the Roman gods, they were absolutely physically perfect. They were all in great shape. They had all their limbs. The limbs are only broken off later. Um, they, they don't fall off. They're actually broken off by uh, the people who defeated the Romans as a, Romans as a symbol of, uh, of anger at their, uh, at their civilization. Uh, the, the rabbis didn't do this, but they, they warned against it. What they said is that if someone, according to Roman tradition, is going to be physically perfect, then they are created in God's image. But if they're not physically perfect or emotionally or spiritually or intellectually perfect, they are not in God's image and therefore are considered to be completely and totally expendable. And we saw that the Romans, if a baby was born imperfect, was allowed to die of exposure. Other people who had uh, challenges, again, either physically, intellectually, emotionally, they were considered expendable and they did not to be, need to be taken care of by society. This is why in Judaism we really emphasize the idea of God being invisible to us because no one can say, I'm in the image of God, but you're not. That I am perfect, yet you are flawed. We're all a mess. It's okay. It's all part of being human. We are glorious and holy messes. None of us are ever going to be perfect in any way possible, but it's not our job to be perfect. It is our job to be human. God created us as human beings in order to be perfect. I mean, sorry, not perfect. I should listen to myself. Kind of ironic to make a mistake at this point. God wants diversity. God wants our gifts. If you look at the construction of the tabernacle in the wilderness, it was made out of whatever the people had. And whatever you had to offer was absolutely perfect. It was the right thing. If you had gold, you were lucky to have that, and that was a, a great contribution. But if all you had were scraps of fabric, that was a perfect contribution too, because you were giving 
of yourself. We are the ones who make the world good by celebrating all of God's creation. No one is an accident. No one is a mistake. And part of what the psalm is asking us to do is to see the world through God's eyes, to see what God sees in us, and to see what God sees in others. Again, no one is an accident. No one is a mistake. Now, people make mistakes. People do very terrible and very bad things, but they are still human and we have to approach them as human in a way to solve the whatever the issue is. Uh, Psalm 135, one of the reasons I did uh, choose it is that this is part of our weekly Sabbath liturgy. Uh, we read this uh, every single Sabbath, every single holiday. And the idea of a Sabbath is that all people deserve dignity. It is one of the most radical ideas that the Jewish people ever gave the world, is that every single human being, from the highest to the lowest in status, is entitled to a day every week just because God loves them. Every human being is entitled to dignity. All people have the potential to be partners in bringing good and goodness into the world. And we live in a time of so many difficult and so many painful things that are happening. This psalm is a reminder that when we get away from the idea of how the world is supposed to be, we can turn it into the world that God wants. Not a world of idols, not a world of gold and silver, but a world of humanity at its deepest, flawed, imperfect, messy, and perfectly beautiful in God's eyes. Thank you so much, and I cannot wait to see all of you again in person. In our Visio Divina today, we are moved into the mystery. We are called to praise. True worship is sometimes the path of unknowing. So let's enter the abyss and thrive in wonder now.
As we respond to the message with prayer today, I invite you to close your eyes. Allow whatever images come as you hear the music. Let this movie in your mind be part of your praying, not questioning or analyzing too much. Just let it be. Looking, whether outward or inward, is noticing the depths of the beauty of life. And the creator of that beauty is present now and always. When you're tired and feel you can't get through Uncertainty comes over you Just look around When your problems seem too much to bear Unsure if there's someone who cares Just look around Whether stranger, neighbor, family each other in tough times we can depend. Look around, kindness, love is ours to share. We can see it everywhere. Though it might seem like forever, look around. Even in our darkest night, things are gonna be alright. We'll get through just look around. O oh God of our hands and feet, our heads and hearts, we give thanks to you for the imperfection of our humanity and the tangible beauty of your creation. Give us the courage to be flawed and genuine. Guide us into the knowledge of being perpetually loved. May your spirit energize all the ways we build relationships and confront injustice everywhere. Draw us together to be your people who walk in solidarity, loving justice, showing mercy, and walking humbly with you from generation to generation. As the disciples of Jesus, we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Sometimes it can be hard to see Life is full of possibilities So look around and the life you live and look around. Outstretched arms and many helping hands. Don't give up on all your dreams and all your plans. Look around. Kindness of us to share. We can see Things are gonna be all right. We'll get through this together. Just look around. Look around. Kind 
Thank you for worshiping God with us today. We are an open and affirming congregation, welcoming you and declaring you belong. Please say hello in the YouTube chat or leave us a comment. Subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can find us again easily. As the song says, we'll get through this together with outstretched arms and many helping hands. This is one way to remember that God is with us, to be with and for others. We respond to God's beauty with giving commitments mailed to the church office with donations given to the church and with many other ministries on our website, www.ccbucc.org. And so remember God and one another. We continue to integrate contemplative practices into our daily lives as a way of opening to the divine in deeper ways, thereby training our spirits for compassion in all things. This week's ritual action is a practice of curiosity. So set a reminder to spend some time exploring a phenomenon that you don't yet know about. Now, it might be further exploration into what Hubble has taught us about the universe. Or it could be something about the behavior of an animal species. Or it could be exploring neuroscience and what goes on in our very own minds. Whatever you choose, as you do so, allow your minds to take in the wonder, contemplate the information slowly, and open your heart. Now, you may want to put a note nearby. The more we know, the more we know we don't know. Wonder and awe that leads to care of creation is good for the beauty of the earth. And now, let us add our singing to the song of creation already in progress.
So it is that we seek wisdom wherever it is to be found. And may the goodness of the creation, the companionship of Christ, and the insight of the Spirit infuse your life and my life now and always.